In this Northern Brewer video, the tale of a most epic brew day at NBHQ, brewing four traditional Norwegian style beers in a day long charge led by two visiting Norwegian farmhouse brewers. We'll recap each of the brews and talk with the brewers about their unique ingredients and historic brewing processes. Plus, we'll share more about their recent time spent in the US. And there's much more video to come related to this project. So please like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and make sure you catch it as soon as we post it. Skål! Hello everybody, welcome to Northern Brewer World Headquarters. Bow! 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 I'm Chip Walton, digital content producer. I'm joined for a very special and unique international brewing conversation with two Norwegian farmhouse brewers, Ivar Jaiton. Johnny Peterson, they are from outside of Voss. Outside of Voss. Outside yeah. of Voss, specifically where? I am from Selan, Vossestrand. And I live at uh, Upeland. They are farmhouse brewers that visited the Twin Cities uh, over the last week and a half and still a few days to come. And the paramount, the climax of that visit was this most epic brew day that we are here to tell you about we're going to show you video of it you're going to see some techniques and things you've probably never seen as an american home brewer um, we're also going to talk about their own home brewing heimabrig brewing uh on their farmhouse uh and then these other brews that they brought to us that aren't, that aren't as nearly as familiar to them but they even wanted to try while we had this large group of people gathered so first of all skull 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 boom boom uh, man, there's actually so much to talk about. Because, like, our brew day last Saturday was long enough to fill this giant infographic flow chart. <laughs> so we have all of these to kind of talk about and share with you. But let's just first real quick talk about um, how this even came to be. How did we end up brewing four beers, one of which was huge, at Northern Brewer with you two <clears throat> awesome gentlemen? Hey, it was a... Um fairly easy decision, I think. You did not think that? <coughs> I'm asking you. Um, we, was... were, we were going over to brew mm -hmm. um, and just showing off the one brew style would be, yeah, plenty enough, <coughs> but uh, why not do all? Yeah. So uh, people <laughs> can show that it's, it's just not one style that come from yeah, the Norwegian traditional brewing. It was supposed to be one big brew in someone's backyard. Yeah. And then Ivar was like, I really want to do these other three. And I was just like, that sounds bigger than someone's backyard. And thankfully, the folks here at Northern Brewer were happy to not only supply the space and the room for one brew, literally in a giant cauldron supported by an old swing set, but all inside of our brew cave, three other beers, turned it into a vent that was... I don't know, I would call it well attended for such a, a niche kind of interest group of brewing. So let us talk about our big brew day slash days. It started Friday night uh, because per tradition, their brews get steeped with juniper and alderwood the whole night before. Talk us through kind of the process of doing that and what that does specifically for your beer. Yeah, do you, oh, yeah, you start the day before to do the brew day shorter. So you put the old wood and the junipers that actually is going to go back into the, uh, what do you call that, uh, sieve? It's like your brew water. Yeah, but you use the... Oh, the, like the... In the bottom. The mash tun. Yeah, in the bottom of the mash tun. Mm -hmm strain we bring that up to a boil and then it stands in hot water till the next day then we go back early in the morning start the same and bring it up to boil and uh, that gives a lot of uh, tannins a woody character color yeah it uh, becomes like a a tea, yeah. a forest tea. He was calling it forest tea, and every new person that walked in the door, the first thing Ivar did, we had 
we pulled a five gallon bucket at the very beginning of the day before we brought it back to boiling. He was handing out cups of the tea and people were loving it. Like I was ended up drinking a lot of it in place of drinking too much alcohol during mm. this like 13 hour day. Yeah. People's eyes were just like a light though. Yeah, mm. they liked it. So I'm trying to think of how to even start because Saturday was so chaotic, collected and chaotic. Well, the night before we also did. So another thing that probably most people don't know or have ever done here is cold mashing whole grains. So we did not mash uh, or did not mill the grains for three of these beers. Uh, and then we cold steep them. That's a tradition in these other regions, right? Yeah. But you've never necessarily done it. I've done it with the boiled mash that I've done. Okay. So that um, uh, I did, uh, yeah, as a tribute to my mom and uncle <coughs> three, three years ago or four, four years ago. And uh, that turned out uh, very well. Mm -hmm. So. I was not concerned about that, but uh, I don't know. I used pale malt that may release the sugar a little easier, but uh, we got fermentables here as well, but it might not be like 12% as I'm used to. It <laughs> might be like more four, five, five. Yeah, the grist for these, uh, so at his house, he would use pale and flaked oats. Here we went with six row and malted oats, partly because you wanted to just mm. see how they go, partly because six row would have been... The traditional Norwegian grain. Uh, maybe we pause real quick to talk about these other three beers. So this one is called Konyul. Konyul. And it comes from? Northwestern region. Um, it uh, is specific, uh, you can say, at the coast, like all Sundsundmøre and in, inland from there. Raw ale. Raw ale. So it's not uh, boiled once it runs off, which we'll talk about still again in a minute. The Telemark beer is a boiled mash. So after this cold mash, whole grain overnight, then you put that son of a gun on a fire. In our case, we used a propane burner because we already had one open fire going <laughs> so slow, here on site. Slowly bring it up. Slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nathan and Steve basically yeah traded off other people visiting were kind of taking turns but you have to slowly stir it to make mm. sure it doesn't scorch and burn yeah you bring it to a boil yeah and then they cut the then you cut it and it mashes yeah sure does uh. sure does Woo. there we got uh, grain from Jørgen uh, Eving and we used six row to uh, get a little more sweetness. And uh, that's the same we cold mashed and waited. And that one waited a little longer than the Royal. So you get more efficiency, the more you wait. Yeah. Uh, with, the, with the pale malt, I would say three hours with a six row you need a little more time in lead that you can uh, or you can easily double the time yeah. in a sealed container or more malt if you have a bigger yeah. container or or you can choose to cautiously crush all grains but not like you do here yeah, yeah. here is fine crushed pretty much yeah you can just crack the shells this is a smoky <clears throat> beer this is an That's alderwood it. smoked malt that they brought bags of with them um, and it is people here likened it to beef short ribs or brisket, not this like burnt campfire kind of smoke, but like a very rich, um, saturated smoke that from eating the raw grain to the cold mash to the hot mash the next day, people just kept wanting to go over to that mash time. Like you got to smell this. And even towards the end, I noted it started to smell kind of whiskey. Like it almost started to take on this like peat. Not nearly as intense as peat, but it seemed to transform in that last like hour of yeah, mash. It's, it's intense smoke. Yeah. And that you only, mm. if your brain compares that to something, you only get that in whiskey. Mm, true. So or it, food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is why it always makes me think of like a smoked 
meat or fish. So it's hard to do these in order because that day we were just kind of mm. all over the place, but we essentially, the next day after these cold mashes, we topped off with the freshly second time boiled juniper infusion into either coolers mm. for the Telemark, no, for the corn yol and the short dog, the smoked one. The Telemark is in a baby copper kettle that they also shipped over to us. So there's just a lot of moving parts, but there's also a lot of waiting around for three hours, waiting yeah. for a mash. Um, a brew day is a brew day. A brew day is a day. Yep. Cool thing about two of these beers as well, as you can see, is they're running off into hops through a strainer. That's kind of our modern adaption of how, of what process. A hop poach or a hop sieve. Hop sieve. Yeah. How would you perform that or set that up? Uh, it's um, already made, like a square okay. that you put under the... Okay. So just run through that. <laughs> or modern, you, t you put it in a, in a bag, and then you just put the uh, lysis over the edge, and it strains through that. All of this is to say is during all of these small little brews, Johnny was over at the St. Paul Homebrew Club's big brew system. So this is a 30 gallon mash kettle or a mash ton and then two 25 gallon kettles. Um, and there's there are people taking handfuls uh, of, of this juniper infusion to all these coolers, these smaller systems. But tell us about the big beer that you guys know the most about, the Heimabri. We start mashing that in small batches. Small batches, uh, because we use um, nearly boiling uh, uniform inf infusion, so we can't uh, do it in a fast way. We have to we have to um, to use some time, so the temperature go down, and then we and we um, we bring a hot uniform infusion many times in it, so the temperature is going up and down and. And uh, when the mash is um, is uh, good, really fast, mm. um, then we throw it up in the big mash gear. So um, I think we did it for five times small mashes. Mm. Um, and then we we have um, uniform infusion over the mash. Mm. So that it won't dry out, um, but uh, it will uh, then um, uh, swallow. So we have to to go for more infusion afterwards. So until it nearly is on the top, and mm. then we had it for three hours, mm -hmm. but not four hours, I think, because yeah. you uh, <laughs> began with this uh, raw ale. Yeah, but the longer the better, <clears throat> yeah. I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we should also, we were, the whole part of the whole thing here was to take their farmhouse traditions, which are often very sensory. What does it taste like? How hot is the elbow or the mm. finger? When I came and brewed with you, I kept asking you, like, what do you think the gravity is? What do you think the temperature is? You're like, yes, hundreds of years <laughs> don't need to know. Um, but we wanted to know. So we were walking around with pH meters. Uh, we had kind of always, when Americanizing this recipe and previous things of just me and you, we've always been like, mash at 160. And when you were done doing all your equalizing your stuff, it was 161. <laughs> yep. So we're just like, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, just how many of these things kind of agree with each other, both in the traditional historical method and also the kind of more, more modern uh, taking more readings, being a little more analytical. Uh, should we speak a little bit about the hops? Sure. Yeah. And um, in the um, Heimabrig, we put the uh, hops in, in the wort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, and we call it uh, homelebeit. Um, and then we put it in the copper cauldron. And uh, next uh, wort, we put another hops in it. So. And the we were all doing the an ounce. In we were the basically doing an ounce per kettle uh, on its way out to the cauldron. 30, 30, 30 28 grams. grams. 
Yeah, 30 yeah. games, yeah. yeah. But are we winning a bit as, uh, as we do it at all? Yeah, <laughs> a handful. Yeah, a little bit there or there. Yeah. Hops, we, we kind of called them first word hops on our document just to put it in something we could wrap our head around. Then the hops for two of these beers, uh, we just ran through a yeah. sieve, a hop sieve. As you would call cold hopping or... Like you're doing uh, we, IPAs? We call it like Whirlpool or a hop yeah. stand. Yeah. It's almost like an inline hop stand, but like a steep yeah. uh, because it's still hot at mm. that point. And then the Telemark was interesting as if everything about that beer wasn't interesting. That gram or that um, ounce of hops went into the actual mash yeah. mm. as they were stirring it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what it's just like so many weird things with that one specifically. Just like you could see people standing around just being like, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's going to happen? Mm. So we mash for three hours, then we run it off, and this is when the fun really begins. Because <laughs> we're running off into smaller kettles and taking it out to the beautiful copper kettle that you guys sent over. And that through Ross's resourcefulness, we found a, a second use swing set support structure and a solo stove. So in your places, mm. these are cooked over open fires. Yeah. yeah, and you manage the fire in order to control the boil. But a solo stove is very effective. Dude, we learned <laughs> not necessarily the hard way. We learned the easy way. Yeah. That thing came to a boil. So this copper kettle you sent holds 130 liters mm. at the top. Mm. 120, yeah. yeah. Um, and we had rigged it one way. We won't get too into it, but there was some definite like homebrew, homebrewer ingenuity and innovation because we kind of had these two hooks. We thought they were flat enough, but you were worried it was going to tip. So now we were building. We were in the, the tool room of Northern Brewer with the chop yeah. saw. Like, it was beautiful. It was a thing of beauty to watch it come together. Um, so now we have this well-supported, very high-efficiency fire. Mm -hmm. Got all the work in there, about 100. We started with about 125, maybe. But it was boiling so fast that we kept dosing it with the juniper infusion. Yeah, we had to do that. Yeah. But that one boiled almost just as far, fast. So this is the result. And from what we taste now, it's quite a much more, quite much more sugar in it. So that can, that can go fairly high, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was 1090. There were times where it was almost pushing 11, 11, mm. like 13 even. We just kept diluting it. When they when brew, they like it to be at least three, if not four or five hours. And that's because of this caramelization mm. yeah. effect that turns a pale malt grist into a very red beer. Um, and that's because what your Kvike, you know, Jernus most popularly for the area, but now your own homes, farmsteads, Kvike Salon, um, kind of talk a little bit about the importance of that hard boil. Yeah, it's the caramelization and it supports yeah the the flavor, and uh, we also mash quite high, so you get heavier sugars, yep. and that is actually what the uh, quake coats itself with when it's going into I call it hi hibernation, like uh, we would call it fall uh trube almost kind of yeah. like the silty layer at yeah. the bottom when it's done yeah and then you can dry it and it's still in a is it's still alive because it ends at a higher residual sugar it's so that sugar helps protect it yeah others other things also do but uh, yeah it goes into carbonating in that so you can dry it and you can freeze it and you can keep it for years and years if you want to keep it more than one to two years i would <coughs> recommend to freeze it but just for a year it should be fine as dried flakes so then the flip side of taking all of that wort out to the solo stove kettle cauldron setup is uh it was going so fast and so high that we were like, we should kill this. So we're out there with spray bottles to try to knock this fire down. Then one scoop at a time, uh, one gallon at a time, back into kettles, back into the brew cave for immersion chilling. And then we had assigned, you know, helpers got priority. So the helpers for the day got five gallon carboys of one of 
these mini beers uh, and then it wrapped up way quicker than I thought. From having been at your house for a 17 hour brew day once upon a time, I thought we would be here till midnight, but we wrapped up about six. Um, mm. So I, the first thing I wanted to note is the first thing that we Americans were like, this is not going to work. How the heck can this even be? Those whole grain, cold mash, then bumped up with boiling water the next day and mash. They did release sugars. We got everything from 1040 starting on the corn oil to um, 1056 on the smoked one. Granted, as you pointed out a moment ago, it also sat way longer yeah. because all these other activities kind of forced us to kind of put it in pause mode. Um, so everybody, we either pitched Ododol in most of the raw ales or your Saland in the Heimabrig and... Rivenes is one here. Rivenes also got put in a Heimabrig. And then Salan went into the smoked yep. beer. Man, it was wild. So we're going to include a link to this really cool flow chart because I think it's really interesting. Uh, and we'll keep that in our like public access file. So what I want to talk next, so let's actually talk about this. So this is day three sample yeah. in Norway. This would be considered maybe a mini Opskaka. Opskaka, yeah. The function of that event is what? <coughs> Testing the fresh, fresh brew. You should have all the flavors there. Even though it's not done, it's still fermenting. Yeah, this is fully fermenting. And what do you get out of it? Fruitiness, very much up front. It's sweet, so it supports a lot of that. You get like a resinous from the juniper and alderwood. You get some tannins from the Barks and all the wood. Uh, this is like a two tone quake. So you, you get the fruitiness and you get a little bit what you call earthy, what I call brunos in the second back draw. Um, I like this, I like to drink this. Uh, I prefer the Opskok, actually. Versus a more finished beer? Yeah, I like this. And back in the day, they would have drank this more readily as a community. Like, you might not have even yeah, you, seen this beer finish. The, these guys gathered up when they saw, uh, when they knew the neighbor had been brewing. Uh, he had to give away beer when people met up to show off. Yeah. And it should be sweet and it should be strong. So people actually should be a bit drunk mm -hmm. and uh, you should at least uh, have uh, one third of the brew drunk up yeah. that day. When you have a whole farm community helping you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> at least a few friends. You yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so then I want to talk about just kind of what it meant to see this come together. Uh, how did it make you feel to see St. Paul homebrewers specifically come to kind of be your assistant brewers? But I mean, this room, the break room was jam packed. It was loud. Yeah, it yeah. got a little hype there for yeah, a little bit. Like, was, I think that, that that was more than I expected. I would like to mm. happy to see if five or 10 people could meet up, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it was full with people the whole day. I don't know, 50, 60. Yeah. Maybe more with the people going, just say hello and then mm -hmm. stay for a short while. Yeah. Yeah, people from uh, the Norwegian tradition co community here mm -hmm. and uh, and a woman from Minnesota Vikings. Oh, uh, yeah. Idane. Idane. The woman, we went to a Vikings game their second day here and the... I don't know, call her like, kind of like the section sap chaperone. She was saying hello to everybody. Took to these guys, and a week later, she's here for three hours hanging out with us. Uh, I felt like you guys kind of had that magical glow everywhere we went. People were like, wanted to talk to you, wanted to hear about it, the breweries yeah. we went to. Um, 
fishing, uh, the academics yeah. who came, a lot of academics came uh, to kind of learn uh, about this. Um, maybe even some offers to translate some yeah, wrong, some literature that yeah. you brought with you. He, uh, he gave it to, I don't remember her name, yeah. but she's a knight of Norway. And she is professor at uh, St. Olaf's. So she's going to put that book into a library about, uh, it's a book about uh, the believings and tradition around Norwegian brewing. And they're going to trans translate it together and hopefully show you wow. here. What about you, Johnny? How, what was your expectation and, and how did you feel to see that turn out? Uh, well, uh, uh, St. Paul uh, Home Brewing Club, um, very, very nice to meet them. They are very good brewers and we couldn't have done this without them and uh, all the gears. So uh, I was very excited about that and um, they are really nice people. And, uh, and for the beer, uh, the flavor of the malt is fantastic. Mm. I think it's for the six room. Mm. It, me, it uh, takes me back to old days in Norway. Mm. Really? Really, yes. Okay. Uh, because uh, me and my friend we stole and uh, actually borrowed <coughs> uh, some beers from uh, my father. And um, it brings me back to the old days. Mm. Really. That noticeable from six row to pale. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. It's fantastic. We have to do a shout out to the crew and Chop and yeah. Brew as well. Oh, do we? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other half of my brain. But yeah, we've done, you know, I feel like we tried really hard to promote your being here. Uh, there could have been more, there could have been less, you know, but I think we got the word out to the right. Yeah. The right uh, subsection of people. Yeah. You had a lot of really... Some people that could care less, I don't care less, but they were here a little bit more for the heritage history side mm. than the tech nerdy. Those people that showed up at eight o'clock with their notebooks, those were the nerds, our people. All day. The technical nerds sitting here taking notes and um, getting their mind blown kind of like every 30 minutes with like, what? They're running that off through hops? What? They're going to boil that mash? You're going to have to stir that the entire time? Oh my goodness. Uh, so the idea here is... Um, Everyone who took some of these are fermenting them. We've been getting reports daily. Most of them, this is down to 1046 from 1090. Um, we're going to gather tonight to Obskaka with all of the other ones, but then we're gonna have a finished beer tasting event. I believe that's most likely gonna be October 17th here at Northern Brewer HQ. That will be open to the public. Uh, there may not be a whole lot of every one but there should be enough for many samples for an evening event and we'll kind of wrap up this project there we'll make sure we give you guys notes um yeah i mean i keep i feel like i want to keep talking about it because it was just so much that happened but i feel like we've touched on the main things um i really just kind of it blew my mind as the forces came together to make this happen. Even looking at this chart, it makes my blood pressure spike a little bit. <laughs> Even though it's in the rear view mirror, I'm like, oh no, oh man. So many pieces of equipment borrowed from so many people, so many hands kind of involved with these beers. So it means a lot that you guys were willing and able to kind of come over and do this. I know you put a lot of yourselves, your time, research, resources into being here. So I took you fishing. Yet? Yeah, and we're happy that you people around there came and yeah showed interest in what we were doing. Hopefully, some people will will try a little modern version of this and make it happen. Yeah, mm. I should say the end goal here is to try to put out some modern-ish <clears throat> versions of how to do all four of these mm. in the very near future um, through Northern Brewer channels. This one we could already do because St. Paul Club has done it twice, but we'll wait mm. until we kind of have yeah, but a no, feeling of but, all of these. But now you have uh, copper kettles yourself, so both the crew and Chop of Chop and Brew and uh, the St. Paul Brew mm -hmm. Club, they can, you can go 
I'm gonna traditional do a baby batch, a little but you seven have, gallon high you, ha you have to go together and do it every Christmas and every summer. That's the deal for keeping the kettles. We're obligated now to brew in these copper kettles a couple times a year. It ain't no thing. Um, yeah, anything else you want to say? Keep on brewing. <laughs> Just kvike it. Just kvike it. You heard it straight from some Norwegian farm house brewers. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and see more of what comes of this. Make sure you follow us on social so you can see when we do the blog with the recipes and just follow us. See how many other countries we can lure to HQ to show yeah. us their indigenous Ooh. brewing processes. All right. Skål. Uh, Skål. Skål. Uh, hit me with some jaw harp, DJ. Clink, <laughs> clink. <laughs>